Thank you for coming again to more lectures on focus. Um, in this section this afternoon, um, I'll be talking about uh, a few topics in the semantics of scalar focus particles. Um, and I'll be sharing four sort of, uh, sort of areas, problems of interest um, with you this afternoon. Um, so one is uh, this issue of so-called scale reversal in the literature on scalar particles. So let's first get started by uh, sort of reiterating what the meaning of even generally is. So even introduces a presupposition um, or some kind of not at issue inference that the projacent proposition is less likely than its alternatives or perhaps alternatively that it's more surprising or somehow more noteworthy, right? So we can order it in some scale, but most importantly, the projacent is somehow particularly somehow special. It's less like unlikely, it's noteworthy. Um, and that's the meaning that we derive in 124 uh, that we've seen before. Um, and this seems to make sense uh, for basic cases of even, like this uh, classic example, Bill even read syntactic structures. Uh, this sentence, um, for this to be felicitous, it has to be felicitous in a context where uh, somehow reading syntactic structures or syntactic structures, the book, somehow is less likely to be read, right? It's um, for all alternatives x to syntactic structures, the proposition that Bill read syntactic structures is less likely or more noteworthy than that Bill read x. But Cartanen and Peters observed that the scalar inference of even is reversed in downward entailing environments. So let's take a look at the neg 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 negated sentence in 126. So Bill didn't even read syntactic structures. Here, it seems that we get an inference that it's not that reading syntactic, it's not that syntactic structures is the, is the most surprising thing to read or the uh, le less the uh, least likely thing to read. Instead, it's the opposite, that syntactic structures should have been the most likely thing to read or the least surprising thing. And then you say, Bill didn't even read syntactic structures, right? Um, and so the inference here seems to be that for all alternatives x to syntactic structures, that proposition that Bill read syntactic structures is more likely than all those other alternatives that Bill could have read. So there are broadly two approaches to this so-called scale reversal behavior in the literature. The first is the ambiguity theory. So the ambiguity theory says there are just two evens. In English, there's an even pronounced in, that's basically an NPI in downward entailing environments. And there's an e even pronounced in other environments that's basically a PPI, a positive polarity item. In particular, the NPI even would basically have the same syntax semantics as uh, the regular even that we've described already, with the only difference being that the presupposition introduced, the scalar meaning introduced, has the ordering in the reverse order. It says that the projacent in its complement is actually the most likely. It's more likely than all alternative propositions. And then this even is an NPI, and the previous regular even that we've seen would be a kind of PPI, or its use is blocked in environments where the NPI is available. As part of this argument, um, cross-linguistically, we'll note that there are many languages where these two forms of even with roughly this distribution actually are different items. So here's a, a quick uh, table from a number of European languages from this literature. Um, we could come up with a longer table if we wanted to, but that's an argument from this cross-linguistic look, um, although not directly an argument that that is the right theory for any particular language. The second type of theory um, is called the scope theory of even. The idea is the following. The intuition is that even in examples of scale reversal, like 126, 
um, actually takes a higher scope than its pronounced position. So in the example in 126, there was a negation. It was Bill didn't even read syntactic structures. Instead, let's pretend that even is actually taking scope and interpreted higher than the negation. And let's see what happens when we do. So when we do that, roughly we're trying to calculate the LF in 128. So we just calculate the normal meaning for even. So for all alternatives to syntactic structure, that Bill didn't read syntactic structures is less likely than that Bill didn't read aspects or MP. Um, and if we unpack that negation in all of those, each of those orderings, then we can just get that scale reversal behavior. We derive that for all alternatives to syntactic structures, that Bill read syntactic structures is more likely than that Bill read those alternatives, which is the result that we want. So the scope theory, I think, is really clever and conceptually attractive. Um, I've also come to believe that it's wrong. So uh, I want to share some of the concerns or arguments against the scope theory here. Um, I should also clarify, I think it's wrong for English sentential even. So uh, for constituent even in English, it may still be a live option. Um, and also for other languages, it's possible that the scope theory is real. But we're going to concentrate on uh, the English sentential even for the moment. So first of all, this is a criticism of Ruhlmann's, that in the scope theory, the mismatch between the pronounced and interpreted positions of even um, is sometimes described as a covert movement, but it doesn't seem to be a kind of covert movement that we're otherwise familiar with. So for example, um, well, first of all, there is a problem of whether it actually leaves an interpretable trace or not. So uh, in most of the works in this literature, there isn't actually such a thing. So it's a strange kind of movement. But second of all, it doesn't obey the kind of locality constraints that we imagine that even covert movement normally is uh, subject to. So in 129, this is again a grammatical instance of scale reversed even. So they hired no linguist who had even read syntactic structures. This is grammatical. And it's grammatical in the type of context where syntactic structures is something that you expect people to read. Right? That's the context where this is good. They hired no linguist who had even read syntactic structures. What the hell is that department doing? Right? That's the context. Um, so the issue then is that in order to get this reading correctly under the scope theory, even has to be interpreted higher than the no linguist or where no linguist takes scope. So let's just say that it's definitely someplace in the matrix clause with an LF like in 130. But this will get the right interpretation, or at least a very approximately right interpretation. So if we calculate this with the regular even, for all alternatives to syntactic structures, they hired no linguist who had read syntactic structures is less likely than they hired no linguist who had read another book for all other books. Um, again, unpacking the negation there, that means that for all alternatives to syntactic structures, that they hired a linguist who had read syntactic structures is more likely was a priori more likely than that they hired a linguist who had read some other book, right? So that gives us the right intuition that it's more likely for this department to hire a linguist who has read syntactic structures than any other particular book. You might want to make sure that uh, the linguists who you hire have read. But it does so at the expense of really ignoring the fact that even in the surface position was inside an island. In order to get from example 129 to 130, we have to just pretend that even is in a different place. And this is also not a constituent even. This is a, a sentential even. And as we've seen, sentential particles generally follow 
the logic where they take scope in their pronounced position. So it's not like the operator particle theory where what's pronounced is down here and we generally want it to associate with a higher operator. That's not generally the case for sentential particles. So this really would be something exceptional that's described in the scope theory literature as movement, but does not behave like movement. In contrast, the ambiguity theory, I think, also can get the correct inter intuitions or interpretation of examples like this. So uh, in my dissertation and in subsequent work, I've tried to spell out some modifications that are necessary in order to get this to work. But um, the NPI, even in this case, would yield the following meaning. So as described yesterday, there's going to be this kind of generic quantification that's going to be necessary. But the intuition is that the NPI even is just interpreted in its pronounced position by just looking at the material in its complement, but also looking at lower copies of movement. And so we're looking at a variable of, with a specification that it's a linguist, reading syntactic structures as opposed to its alternatives. So even the NPI even, the scale reverse even here, would predict that we get an inference that for generic linguists, so for almost all linguists, all linguists tolerating exceptions, for all alternative syntactic structures, it's more likely that they have read syntactic structures than that they haven't. So this is not even actually a statement about them hiring linguists. This is just a statement about actually expectations about linguists reading syntactic structures. That makes slightly fine-grained distinctions then that empirically we should hope to tease apart. But at least in the simple case like this, um, it's difficult to distinguish between those inferences, but the ambiguity theory also gives us something that seems compatible with the reading and does not need to use this kind of island violating movement. There's also, I'll mention in passing, uh, I think very clever and I think neat argument for the scope theory um, from interactions of quantifier scope and uh, ellipsis, so in ACD constructions in English um, that uh, Nakanishi uh, presents. Um, but I have a reply paper to that where I think actually the argument doesn't go through. And actually, when we look at further examples, uh, those types of constructions that she considered actually forms an argument for the ambiguity theory rather than the scope theory. But I'll leave it just to that for now. I want to move on to share another uh, fact or set of considerations related to scalar particles now, which has to do with the additive part of even. So uh, e English even, but we have similar considerations in scalar particles in many other languages, um, introduces a scalar inference, maybe presupposition. However, it often feels like there's also an additive meaning that's introduced. What do I mean? Well, so let's look at 132. Even John came to the party. In addition to claiming that John came to the party, there are two maybe not at issue meanings that are introduced or required of the context. So one is that John coming to the party is less likely than other people coming to the party. That's the scalar part. But there's also a feeling that there's an additive presupposition, that someone other than John came to the party as well. It seems strange to say even John came to the party if, in fact, John was the only one who came. So a number of earlier authors have have stated that there is an additive component to the meaning of even in addition to the scalar component. But subsequent authors have shown that there are some compelling examples that suggest that there couldn't generally be an additive part, actually. So my favorite paper in this literature, actually, is this, uh, is this manuscript by Mikhail Wagner, um, which I believe is an unpublished manuscript still. But, um, but I think does a really good job trying to digest this literature and sort through the different kinds of examples to see uh, where you feel like you have an additive part and when you don't. 
So um, here are some examples first for as taken as evidence for the additive meaning. So in 133, I heard the results of this year's marathon was surprising. Um, is it true that this time it wasn't a Kenyan who won the gold medal? Oh yes, even a Canadian won it. This is strange. This is judged as strange by many speakers. And, well, you know, let's think about why it would be strange. Maybe a Canadian won it. Fine, let's assume that's true. Is it surprising that a Canadian wins the marathon as opposed to people of other nationalities? Well, I don't want to judge Canadians, but let's just assume for the moment that we believe that that might be an expectation that we share. Even then, it seems strange to say, oh yes, even a Canadian won the marathon. Why would that be? Well, it seems to be quite clearly that that's strange because no one else wins the marathon. There's just one winner of a marathon. Or similarly, in 134, John was a favorite to win the marathon. Did he win a medal? Oh yes, he won even the gold medal. This seems strange. As further evidence, um, these improve when we add possibility modals. So even though only one person wins the marathon, multiple people could win the marathon. So uh, in 135, if we change this to even a Canadian can win the gold medal, the conditions this year are such that even a Canadian could win the gold medal. That's better, right? And we're not talking about hockey again. We're talking about marathons, right? Um, or uh, John is favored to win. Um, you know, conditions are such that John could win even the gold medal, right? That's possible, even though we know John is only going to win at most one medal. But you could win, but let me say the scope of that correctly. There are multiple medals that one person could win, right? Okay. Um, in addition, let's take a look at example 136, right? So I was hoping that at least some of the students would be able to pass the test, but in the end, even everyone was able to do it. This is strange. Why would that be? Again, the scalar part of even should be fine, right? It's less likely that everyone is able to pass the test than for many people to be able to pass the test or for only a few people to be able to pass the test. So the scalar part should be fine, but the problem, according to Wagner here, is that this is unnatural because you have a additive requirement, and the additive requirement is not simply, to be a bit more sophisticated, it's not simply that some other alternative is true, because if everyone is able to, win, to pass the test, then that entails that many people are able to pass the test or some people are able to pass the test. It actually has to be some other non-entailed alternative, which is true as well, and that's not possible because everyone is the strongest item. There is no, no one else that we should claim is able to pass the test if we've already said everyone's able to pass the test. So the additive inference, if there is an additive inference, would be strange here. The strangeness of 136 seems to be due to the additive part. At the same time, as I mentioned before, there is this literature that's developed uh, showing that there is not necessarily an additive meaning. So uh, Ruhlmann, for example, has some examples um, saying, uh, looking at mutually exclusive alternatives, properties like being an assistant professor, being an associate professor, being a full professor, and you ask, is Claire an assistant professor? No, she's even an associate professor, and that seems fine. So this paper of Wagner's that I want to highlight has a really neat observation, I think, which is that the presence or absence of the additive meaning of even appears to depend on the syntax of even that's chosen. In particular, constituent even encodes the additive meaning, but sentential even doesn't. So here's a quick contrast, again, pitting the additive part against the high point on a scale, a universal quantifier. Did John read some of the books? Yeah, John even read all of the books. Fine, right? It's fine with that scalar meaning.
Did John read some of the books? Yeah, John read even all of the books. Stranger, a lot stranger, right? And so that difference, again, the scalar meaning of even should be fine. The difference, Wagner claims, has to be that constituent even in 139b has an additive requirement, but the sentential even in 139 does not. We can also take some of these previous examples and tweak them in precisely this way and see that there is indeed this sensitivity to the position of even. So for example, in 140, we have Ruhlmann's example, which was judged as fine, um, or this is a variant, right? So Claire married an assistant professor, and Sally even married an associate professor. Fine, assuming Sally only marries one person, right? Um, versus Claire married an assistant professor, and Sally married even an associate professor, right? That stranger feels like Sally should have married multiple people or multiple professors, something like that. Um, and again, with the gold medal example, so in 141, right, the results of the marathon were surprising. A Russian won the gold medal. No offense to Russians. This is Wagner's example again. Um, even a Canadian won the silver medal. Strange, assuming only one winner, right? It's a constituent even. The silver medal was won even by a Canadian. Strange, constituent even. The silver medal was even won by a Canadian. Fine, and compatible with a situation where there's only one winner. So I'll refer you to the Wagner manuscript for discussions about how to then understand this difference, which appears to be almost a syntactic difference between sentential even and constituent even. And I'll also flag that there's an interesting relationship of this contrast, if this indeed is the right characterization of this effect, to the discussion we've been having in some previous sessions in these lectures about the relationship of the morphos morphosyntax of sentential particles and constituent particles. If, for example, as I've suggested in previous lectures, that some, in some languages, constituent particles and constituent particles and sentential particles might actually be basically an operator and particle. Uh, but just a pair of these with a particular meaning, and there's just a choice of which one to pronounce, then actually this kind of description of these facts where the semantics is actually different between sentential particles and constituent particles could potentially be a challenge for that approach. The third case study or set of issues I want to share with you having to do with scalar particles has to do with the fact that scalar particles commonly are used in the construction or morphology of NPIs. So NPIs, of course, are licensed in downward entailing environments. Um, and many authors have considered a version of uh, the following hypothesis, that an NPI is a overt or covert even together with an element which is weak on a scale. So roughly, let's say, an indefinite. Um, so there are a number of languages where, quite explicitly, that is how you form NPIs. So Hindi is one such language. This is Utpal Ahiri's work. So in uh, Hindi, you can say one ek, or you can use this even particle, literally even one, ek b, and that's how you say any, NPI any. Similarly, you can take other indefinites, other weak elements on scales, like someone or something, and add even and create corresponding NPIs. So the question is why that should be, right? How does this work? Is that actually predicted by the semantics? So interestingly, as Lahiri in particular really makes clear, um, this is something that is predicted by the semantics of the scalar part of even. So let's consider um, even associating with someone. This is basically in a kind of pseudo-Hindi, or we can just think of this as some, uh, some kind of uh, pseudo-language. But let's take, I saw someone, narrow focus on someone, and now let's get even to associate with it. 
So the set of alternatives will be propositions of the form that I saw someone, the projacent, that I saw many people, that I saw everyone, etc. Now even, the scalar part of even applying to that produces the following presupposition. That that I saw someone is less likely than that I saw many, and that I saw someone is less likely than that I saw everyone. And now we notice that this is a strange thing to claim about the world, right? The proposition that I saw someone actually is logically entailed by that I saw many. In every situation where I saw many people, I saw someone. And in every situation where I saw everyone, I saw someone, right? So there's no way that that I saw someone is less likely than that I saw many and that, that I saw someone is less likely than that I saw everyone. So this introduces systematically a presupposition which just cannot be satisfied in any conceivable situation just because of the structure of the alternatives and the meaning of even. However, that doesn't mean that this even indefinite combination is just totally ungrammatical. It has to do with the logical organization of these scales. So in particular, if we have an intervening negation, let's see what happens. So if we have an intervening negation, so even not I saw someone, then when, we'll, when we look at the complement of even, the projacent is I not see someone, and just think of that as a existential indefinite. So that means I didn't see anyone. That's the projacent. And then the alternatives to that include the projacent as well as not I saw many and not I saw everyone, etc. And now here notice that the projacent proposition is the least likely proposition. So even will introduce the scalar inference that it's false that I saw someone is less likely than it's false that I saw many. And that is true. It's false that I saw someone is less likely than it's false that I saw everyone. And that's also true just because of the logical organization of these items on the scale. We can unpack that negation too, and it's a little bit clearer too. We just take away the negations and flip the sign on the likelihood, right? So what even me introduces here is that that I saw someone is less likely than that I saw many. And sure, that's obvious. It's easier to satisfy I saw one person than to satisfy I saw many people. And similarly, that I saw someone is more likely than that I saw everyone. So even in this situation introduces a presupposition which systematically is always satisfiable. Right? Now there's a question, there's an interesting observation that actually this may be vacuous. We can come back to this in the question period if you're interested. But it's always going to be satisfiable. Right? So the idea then is that the scalar meaning of even, the independently uh, motivated scalar meaning of even, associating with an indefinite will systematically create a strange meaning unless it's across a downward entailing operator. And then more generally, there's this idea that the scalar meaning of even can then be used systematically and productively by languages in order to create or uh, create different forms of NPIs and licensing behaviors. Um, so here I shared the logic, especially from Lahiri's work on uh, Hindi, about how even is useful for creating NPIs with classic downward entailing licensed NPI behavior. Um, in a recent manuscript of mine, I show how the combination of even with conditionals, expressions of the form even if, can use, again, the logical property of even to systematically generate items which are free choice items. Now finally, in the last section of this, uh, this short lecture, I want to share with you one particular case study of a scalar particle um, in an understudied language. So this is work that I've done with uh, my student, um, my RA, now uh, soon going to grad school at MIT, uh, Keely New.
Um, so we looked at the interpretation and distribution of the particle ma in Burmese. Ma is very interesting when you just first look in a dictionary and look at the scalar particles, you know, which I do and maybe, maybe we all should. Um, because ma shows up with two entries in, a, in some classic dictionaries. For example, Okul, this classic reference uh, grammar and dictionary um, of Burmese, simply gives two items for ma. There's ma a, translated as even, and ma b, translated as only. And we thought this was very surprising and interesting. But let's take a look at some actual data and see how this works. So um, there is indeed an exhaustive use of ma. So here's an example in 145. Uh, for example, someone says, I wonder what Aung drank. And you say, Aung water ma drank. That's fine. And that is an exhaustive meaning. It means something like, it's water that Aung drank. We're going we're gonna to give these English cleft translations, and you'll see why. Um, Crucially, we can diagnose the fact that this is exhaustive because you can't continue it with something like, he also drank beer. That's just judged as an infelicitous uh, continuation. Um, we can diagnose uh, ma, the exhaustive use of ma, as basically a cleft-like behavior rather than an only-like behavior um, because of its behavior under certain embeddings, such as negation. So when we have a biclausal negation, such as in 146, this is literally something like, it's not right, it's false that Aung water ma drank. Right? Um, this ends up giving us an interpretation that can be translated by the English negated cleft, it isn't water that Aung drank. So with sufficient continuations and testing this in different conversational contexts, we can establish that the speaker of this utterance is committed to the belief that Aung didn't drink water, fine, um, and that Aung drank something, and that, Aung, that water itself could be a maximal answer to the question of what Aung drank. And this is, in a sense, unpacking the different meanings, the, the not at issue meanings and negated at issue meaning of a cleft type meaning. So in English too, if we say it isn't water that Aung drank, that does convey the negation of the, the prejacent, that Aung didn't drink water. And that's crucially different from the behavior of a negated only. So for example, in English, if we say Aung didn't only drink water, then actually we project the projacent. We project the commitment that Aung did drink water. And that's not the behavior we have in 146 here. Instead, when we negate with this higher biclausal negation, exhaustive ma, we get a negated cleft behavior rather than a negated only behavior. As promised, there's also a scalar use of ma demonstrated in 147. So, uh, here's a context. There were only two drinks available at the party last night, water and beer. Aung is a child, so he's more likely to drink water than beer. So then we say, uh, Aung water ma didn't drink. That means roughly something like Aung didn't even drink water. And that's felicitous in this context. It's judged as strange to say Aung beer ma didn't drink, right? That just seems strange. And we'll point out this feels strange in the same way, or we can, we can claim in the same way that in this context, the English uh, negated even, Aung didn't even drink beer, is strange. So in this situation where we have these different explicit alternatives, we see an asymmetry between those alternatives in the behavior of even, uh, excuse me, in the behavior of ma, which suggests a scale sensitivity, right? It's sensitive to the relative likelihood of these different items on the scale, and that's different than the exhaustive use that we saw previously. So a question which uh, Keeley investigated um, by working with uh, speakers of Burmese in Singapore is when is, descriptively, 
When is ma interpreted as exhaustive? When is it interpreted as scalar? And in fact, our speakers do translate this using only or cleft in one case and with even in another. When do you get these different translations? But we didn't just rely on translations. When do you get that scale sensitive behavior and when do you not by actually evaluating these in different contexts? And the answer is a little peculiar, but we'll unpack it. The answer is that the, so the apparent scalar uses of ma requires two ingredients. It requires a local sentential negation, which we've already seen, and also in particular, it requires this final ta marker. So now is a point where I should probably step back and tell you something very quickly about the Burmese verbal complex which is that the ver Burmese verbal complex has a verb and then tense aspect markers, and then it ends with this marker sometimes called a, a mood marker. And it can indicate a realis versus irrealis type, which roughly corresponds to a non-future and future usage. But also, interestingly, there are a couple other items that go there as well. So when you have a negation, that often will override that position. So in addition to the negation prefix, you get this bu final marker. That's in 148. We'll look at 148 in a moment. But also, I'll highlight, uh, with, yeah, I'll highlight by going back a slide in 147 that in these cases of scalar ma, we have negation on the verb, but also the final marker ta rather than the final marker which is normally expected with negation. In 147a, with ma ta verb, you get Aung didn't even drink water. That's roughly the translation that you get. But instead, we go to 148, which is exactly the same kind of sentence, but now we've changed the verb to a ma bu verb, which is the default negated form of the verb. And now we get a different interpretation. This is no longer the scalar interpretation. This is the interpretation of a cleft with negation in its scope. In other words, roughly uh, translated as, it's water that Aung didn't drink. And furthermore, interestingly, in this case, because it's that cleft meaning, it's no longer scale sensitive. So still, again, in that same context where we have these two items, two different things that Aung might have drank at a party, one is more likely than the other. And let's say you want to know which one didn't Aung drink. Then you can say Aung water ma didn't drink with this verb. You can also say Aung beer ma didn't drink. So looking at the felicity conditions, we see that you no longer need, you no longer get this asymmetry, this scale sensitivity, when we're looking at the ma bu verb. You only get the scalar behavior of ma descriptively with the combination of a negation and sentence final ta. So now we want to know what that sentence final ta is doing, how we get this interpretation. So the proposal that we developed is the following. Um, so first, we'll adopt the operator particle view. So this is a constituent particle ma. We'll just assume that it corresponds to a covert ma operator on the clausal spine, taking propositional scope. And then what we'll claim roughly um, is that the presence or absence of sentence final ta will indirectly track the relative scope of the ma and negation. Um, we actually have an analysis of exactly what this relationship is and what ta does more generally um, in our paper. This is a, a manuscript online. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the question period as well. But for our purposes, it suffices to say that ta indirectly tracks what the relative scope of the ma and negation. To model this, um, let's let uh, capital C be the set of relevant focus alternatives to the sister of ma at LF. And we're also going to close that set under conjunction um, and order it by the likelihood ordering. And then um, ma is going to have this meaning in 149. So it's just going to introduce this presupposition, which is um, this meaning that no less likely alternative is true. And this is roughly the meaning of a cleft uh, 
the not an issue part of a cleft meaning. And it furthermore will just pass up the projacent proposition in its complement as the at issue content of the whole proposition. Let's see how this works. So here we have some diagrams, again in this context where we have two alternatives, Aung drank beer and Aung drank water. And we're be going to be considering, as we mentioned, those two alternatives as well as the conjunctive alternative that Aung drank water and beer. And in these diagrams in 150 and 151, we've just added some annotations to show you which one is more or less likely given the contextual information. So contextually, Aung is a child, remember? So Aung drinking water is more likely than Aung drinking beer. And each of those atomic alternatives is more likely than Aung drinking both. And that we just get logically. Now consider first the behavior of Ma in 150. So we have Ma, Aung drank water. No negation here, right? What is Ma going to uh, give us? So the meaning of Ma, again, is claiming that no less likely alternative is true. So we look at the projacent and look at its less likely alternatives. The less likely alternatives are that Aung drank beer and that Aung drank water and beer. So we negate each of those and introduce those as presuppositions. And we continue to assert the projacent water. So in the end, what we get is an assertion that Aung drank water and the set of presuppositions, which means essentially this exhaustive inference that Aung didn't drink anything else. So we're getting basically the cleft type meaning, it's water that Aung drank. We get exactly the same parallel behavior if we have, again, no negation in 151. But now where the sentence is projacent is the beer alternative. Again, we do the same thing. We look at the less likely alternatives. Here there's only one, that Aung drank water and beer. We negate that. That's the pre presupposition. And we also assert the projacent that Aung drank beer. Again, we get the exhaustive meaning that Aung drank beer and presupposing that nothing else was drunk. So uh, it's beer that Aung drank. That cleft type meaning is what we get. This general logic will apply as long as Ma takes widest scope, including the case where Ma scopes over negation, which we claim is what happens when you have that negative verb without the final ta in 148. What's interesting is what happens in, excuse me, what happens in the case where we have negation and Ma and uh, the negation takes scope over ma. So let's see what happens here. So again, we'll illustrate in these diagrams the alternatives in the complement of ma, and we'll calculate that meaning first. And this is going to be familiar. So on the left-hand side in 152, uh, Aung drank water is the projacent. We introduce the presupposition from ma that Aung didn't drink beer and didn't drink both. And now, though, we just pass up that presupposition. The meaning of ma, the scalar part of ma, is done. And then we calculate negation. And the negation will only negate the at issue meaning. It will negate the pre projacent that Aung drank water. So we end up with this meaning that says Aung didn't drink water and also didn't drink beer and didn't drink both. right? OK. Now notice, though, that the presupposition there, uh, excuse me, I, I started to say something wrong. Let's look at 153. In this case, we're looking at the Aung drank beer item. So Aung drank beer is the projacent. We calculate the presupposition just like we did before. So that gives us that you didn't drink both. And you assert that you assert the negation of the projacent, which is that Aung didn't drink beer. Now, interestingly, let's think about the combination of the, pre the assertion and negation, the, the assertion and the presupposition in these cases. So the meaning in 152 
the presupposition is informative and logically compatible with the assertion. It just says that Aung didn't drink water and also uh, didn't drink beer. That's part of the presupposition. 153 is kind of a strange meaning, though, because we're asserting that Aung didn't drink beer, and then we presuppose that Aung didn't drink both. But then, actually, adding ma to the sentence doesn't actually contribute anything, because ma is a purely presuppositional operator. When we add ma to the sentence, all it's doing is adding this presupposition, which in this case is not informative. It's not limiting the context of use of this sentence because Aung didn't drink beer. So in 153, but not 152, the addition of ma doesn't add anything to the overall meaning of the sentence. And so its addition, we claim, actually is marked, uh, for example, by a requirement like non-vacuity. So this is a particular formulation of non-vacuity we borrow from Luca Chernich's work, um, which says that the meaning of a lexical item used in, a, it used in an utterance must affect the meaning of its host sentence, either in its at issue or not at issue meaning, either in its truth conditions or presuppositions. If you're going to add something to a sentence, it has to contribute to the meaning. So you can sort of think of this in a uh, in, as a form of competition, although I don't know that it has to be thought of that way. But roughly the intuition is you have the option of building a sentence with this extra word or without it. And if adding that extra word, that adding that extra lexical item doesn't change the overall expressed meaning, the conventionalized meaning of that sentence, then, then let's put a star on that, right? And so that then is going to give us this kind of non-vacuity constraint, give us the gives us the asymmetry between the example in 152 and 153, which we descriptively claim is basically the scalar behavior of ma, precisely in this case where ma takes scope under negation. But when ma takes widest scope, or including over negation, then it's basically a cleft meaning, and it's not going to be scale sensitive. It's just going to be an exhaustive meaning. So those are the different issues in scalar particle meanings that I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some more questions. Okay. Now we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. Any questions or comments? Well, I have a clarification question. I might be misunderstanding um, what the examples are showing uh, in 150 and 152, but I would have thought that the presuppositions, uh, it, it would have been a union rather than an intersection, or maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Um, so the so thank you. You're asking about the computation of the presupposition in 150 and 152, which is which is the same. Yes. Yes. It it it, it should be the same because uh, if you look at 150 versus 152, you notice that up to the projacent proposition, Aung drank water, and Ma. The structure is exactly the same. The only difference is the negation above, right? Yep. So um, the definition that we give um, for, uh, for the meaning of ma is basically that it introduces a presupposition that says that no less likely alternative is uh, true. Uh, but uh, actually, the way that we unpack that, that we operationalize that, another way of putting it is basically that all less likely alternatives are false. So if we look at the alternatives in this sort of triangle here, at least in this simple context where we just have two atomic alternatives, the projacent is Aung drank water. And then you have two alternatives that are less likely than it. And so the presupposition will 
be the negation of both of those. And then those will be conjoined. And we get that actually from uh, the actual formulation is in 149, which involves this universal quantification, right? So it's saying for all alternatives that are less likely than the prejacent, they ought to be false, right? So that's where we get the conjunction from. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, if, if you're considering them to be atomic propositions, wouldn't it make more sense for it to be like not beer union with not water and beer, for example? So the so part of this was maybe um, something that I glossed over earlier, but so we are generally claiming, um, and this is something that needs to be true, actually not just for us, but for the modeling of some other kinds of scalar particles uh, in other languages as well. But we're claiming that generally the alternatives that are considered by Ma are all closed under conjunction in the first place. So you end up in this case where there are two atomic alternatives. There's actually a set of three alternatives that you consider, which are the three in this triangle, right? So that's how we first end up with this conjunctive alternative, Aung drank water and beer in the first place. And now, logically, both Aung drank water by the context and Aung drank water and beer by just that logic of entailment, those are two alternatives that are both less likely than Aung drank water, but for different reasons. And then we negate them both. Oh, OK. I get it. Thank you. OK. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So we're looking at the triangle in 151, right? Um, or actually, actually, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, so this is just a fact about conjunction, that if you have two propositions, A and B, um, the conjunctive proposition, A and B, is going to entail A and entail B. And whenever you have entailment, um, then uh, yes, if A, if I don't want to reuse A and B, if P entails Q, then uh, Q is guaranteed to be less likely than uh, P. If P asymmetrically entails Q, then Q is less likely than P. Um, and therefore, you know, there's less to satisfy um, to just ensure that Aung drank beer than to ensure that Aung drank water and beer. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, a part of the reason I'm asking is, if we look at 153, um, I just was trying to work out in my head uh, an alternative situation where Aung is an adult and really, really likes to drink alcohol. Um, and now 153 is, um, uh, would make sense, right? Um, didn't even drink beer, even though that's what his preferred drink was between water and beer. That would be his preferred drink. That's right. And I, so that's certainly what we predict. Um, and I don't right now remember if we explicitly tested that. But we know that, I mean, we've, we have different items with things besides water and beer. And generally, that's the direction that this goes, right? So if uh, whatever is most likely for them to drink, that's the thing that you can target with negation and ma in this configuration, and the other item is going to be bad. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
something I can I can follow up on uh, that uh, Mike's question and and my answer um, is there's a basically the reason why this analysis works or that we think this analysis works um, is that we're using we're taking advantage of the fact that the orderings that we have here um, have different sources so um, just as you mentioned now um, as Mike mentioned so the relative orderings of the atomic propositions right whether Aung drank water or Aung drank beer is more likely that is going to be determined by the context right so that'll depend on the facts about the world about your expectations about what Aung is going to drink or what we sort of as a as a um, as discourse participants agree on as an expectation for what Aung is going to drink but the ordering between those atomic alternatives and the conjunctive alternatives actually is always going to be fixed because that is uh, those likelihood relations are ensured by entailment and so that's essentially the trick of why in one situation then we end up deriving always an exhaustive inference what ends up being an exhaustive inference and in the other situation we end up with something that feels like a scalar inference um, from the same semantics just out of curiosity I can still think of an alternative scenario where now let's say um um, is a wine connoisseur and um, there's you know there's water and there's beer and there's three different kinds of wine and the reality of the situation is that what's most likely to happen is that Ong is going to try all three kinds of wine um, um, let's just for simplicity let's say there's a, there's a red a white and a rosé um, uh, uh, would you uh, did, uh, it's starting to get a little bit too comp computational. I can't. I cannot figure out how this works in my head. Um, but it seems to me that it might be the case that one of the conjunctive alternatives is going to be more likely than the uh, uh, either of the three alternative atomic alternatives, where he drinks only one of the three kinds of wine. Yes. Mm -hmm. So okay. So if there's something I should clarify first which is that the meaning of these atomic alternatives are not themselves exhaustified. So the, so the proposition Aung drank white wine doesn't mean Aung only drank white wine. It will also be true in a context where Aung drank all three. Uh, of course. Right, so yeah, so I think even in that context, um, yeah, with these sort of vanilla, non-exhaustified propositions, uh, I don't think you run into that problem. Yeah, OK. So yeah, under the, I guess, under the um, assumption that Ong didn't even drink X, where X is only one of the drinks, then you're going to end up getting the same. Yeah, OK, thank you. You'd have to say something weird, like Ong didn't even compare the three wines, and in which case, the, the, the atomic um, uh, com, uh, alternatives are going to be very different from the ones that are on the screen now. Oh, so that's, yes. Yeah, that's, the, that's, that's the scenario I had in my head, and yes. I just realized the atomic, atomic alternatives will not be one of just one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, so, I mean, generally something that we certainly have, did not look at and honestly, I want to stay away from is how all of this behavior interacts with plurals. But uh, but but um, but yes, I, I think that could be really interesting to look at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the question and answer. Any other questions or comments? Okay. 
have been uh, real rip up in today's conference series. And thank you very much, Professor Michael Ustaka Olawine. Thank you very much.